Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests and industry leaders. Oh, welcome. Laura, welcome. Can I officially lead? Yes, no, no worries. Only 30 seconds late. We can do that again. <laughs> Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Laura. Okay, I'll try this again for the, for the video camera. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests and industry leaders, I'm honored to welcome you to this enlightening panel discussion on accelerating the digital transformation of industry, investing in disruptive technologies, a new toolkit for global decision makers. In our discussion, we will navigate the rich tapestry of innovation, drawing inspiration from the ancient Greek spirit of ingenuity and from modern entrepreneurship. Our distinguished panelists will unravel strategies, challenges, and opportunities showcasing how disruptive technologies shape the future of industries worldwide. My name is Mark Müller-Eberstein. And as the last name gives it away, I am from Seattle, Washington, United States. <laughs> I'm an investor. I'm a member of the Alliance of Angels of the American Capital Association. Um, and I'm very, very fascinated to see what we're discussing today and to learn. Over the years of my Davos presence, I was honored to help the Greek House year after year in different roles as a panelist, as a moderator. And I'm very excited and honored to be here, your guest and host tonight. It allows me to meeting fascinating people and great organizations, so I'm very thankful for the Greek House. Today, especially, we have a brilliant panel. First, I would like to introduce Mr. Bernard Farrin. He's coming to us from Brussels after spending 11 years in Dubai, so I think we're going to get some interesting international perspectives here tonight. Mr. Farrand heads the commercial division and is responsible for sales, marketing, and relationships with customers across the Euroclear group. Previously, Mr. Ferrand was in charge of the business development activities across the European, Middle East, and African and CIS, uh, CIS reasons, where he also acted as chief representative officer for the Euroclear Bank office in Dubai. Next to me here is Mr. Peter Jungen. He has an incredible, impressive career, and I would highly recommend Googling him and his background. For example, in the 90s, he was the CEO of one of the largest European construction companies, Strabag. He is also the trusted friend of several German chancellors. He is the chair of the German and European angel organizations. He is a member of the New York City Angels. He's on the board of many cultural organizations. And bestowed on him was the highest uh, honor the German government can do as the Bundesverdienstkreuz mit Bande, was I glaube ich, der richtige Titel. So, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Jungen has a full and fascinating experience, and the stories he is going to share, he can share, will fill all books, not only one book, but multiple books. So I ask you to stay engaged as we bridge the past with the present, exploring the transformative power of a new toolkit for decision makers and societies. With that, I would like to start the conversation. Maybe a very quick introduction of what does Euroclear do, and then uh, we'll uh, switch to Mr. Jungen. Mr. Ferrand, please. Thank you, Mark. Um, very pleased to be here. Thanks for the Greek House to hosting us. Um, yeah, Euroclear is a special animal for those who are not really in the capital market. But at the same time, Euroclear is what we call a settlement house. So typically in the capital market, you get three layers. The first one is on the trading side. Usually you go either on exchanges, so stock exchanges, or you do over the counter. So you've got Bloomberg, Reuters, etc., helping you to get access and to trade. And then once you trade it, you go to a CCP, so a central counterparty, to do the netting on the clearing side. And then once the netting is done, you go to Euroclear as a settlement house. So typically what we, we do, we're moving cash from one side to the others, and we're delivering the securities from one side to the others. We're talking about bonds, mutual funds, equities, uh, you name it, all the securities, uh, actually. No. What is important is that Euroclear has a mandate to connect what we call the issuers. 
So we, we have a range of close to 20,000 different issuers that use Euroclear as an access point to issue their financial instruments. And again, it can be ETF, mutual funds, bonds, uh, equities, etc. And then we connect them to the investor base. So the investor base is nothing else than pension funds, uh, asset managers, asset owners, sovereign wealth fund, central bank for the reserve management, global custodian, etc. So all the topics we're going to touch today, I think you are living on a day-to-day -day base, making technology, bringing technology Absolutely. capabilities to our users. Mr. Jungen, you have been uh, speaking and being invited to a lot of the angel organizations across the world in your current roles. That's a, yep, looks like the microphone works. Um, tell our audience, please, a little bit more about some of the key questions you're facing over the last couple of years. Well... Um, I think we are more or less on the other end of uh, events uh, where we try as angel investing uh, to financing the new thing, the new ideas. Now, when we talk about um, financing, it is uh, rather about making things happening at the beginning. And when we talk about innovation, I think it is so important to understand the until the 18th century, it was uh, the world was pretty even uh, in development and since then we have the great diversity with uh, capitalism and market economies emerging in the west uh, that that to the present circumstances and the present differences we have so if we talk about innovation everything is based on that now what is it is it uh, to understand it clearly and to make it difficult to invention, uh, different to invention. The invention part of that is turning money into new knowledge and then turning the new knowledge back into money. That's the innovation part. So for it just, it's not enough to research, but it's important that we have the entrepreneurs as the missing link between the invention and the innovation. Without them, it is, nothing is going to happen. S sometimes it's more important to have the entrepreneurs than new knowledge because the, the, with the dissemination today in the world, it's so easy to get access to new knowledge, but it's much more difficult to find the right entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurship culture, which uh, Europe is not the best uh, in it. That may be better in the US and maybe some parts in the world, this is particular with the uh, Chinese, uh, with for, foreign Chinese uh, in all of Asia, and we should have seen what's coming out of uh, China once China goes markets. So what, I'm, so what I'm hearing you saying is a lot of the innovation is really coming from small organizations that are having the ideas of bringing it to the market. I would, it, 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 most of the companies you're working with are probably very established institutions. How often are you seeing the technology coming really out of the left field? So that, that's a very good question indeed. I mean, we a well-established, more than 50 years company. Um, we systematically important, so we safe keep assets in the range of 40 trillion of dollars for or 2,000 clients. And the first things that they look at us is on making sure we have the business resilience and cyber resilience. And it's a bit contradictory to innovation. But at the same time, we do look at innovation. So we have Innovation Hub, we have hackathons, we have different things that brings innovation inside the well-established and robust system that we're running for many years. The way we look at innovation, first of all, I mean, we're not in a driving seat to push innovation. We're rather in a wait-and-see mode, let's face it. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that the innovation or the product that comes to the market is scalable enough considering the size that we have in the industry. But also, we want to make sure that innovation, if we embrace those innovation, it brings efficiency, efficiency for all clients. And I think the whole thing that we've been doing over blockchain, over DLT, uh, over robots, uh, uh, AI, etc., was really focusing on bringing more efficiency for all clients. But I think one of the challenges, we've, we've, I was just in Singapore and I talked about a bunch of startups that are say, trying to sell to the institutional companies. And their biggest challenge is that the large organizations, yes, they can spend a lot of money, but, it will, but they're not engaging with early stage companies early on. I don't know if you see this differently, uh, Mr. Yo uh, Mr. Jungen, if you yes. can see your startup companies engaging earlier with big companies, or is there well, just this big lack? Uh, uh, what we just learned is perfectly okay. Uh, that's um, the step-by-step -step improvements, step-by-step -step, mm -hmm. uh, making things leaner, making more efficient. Mm -hmm. we, we probably talk rather about disruption. 
and it was uh, uh, Schumpeter coined the phrase of creative disruption. Uh, uh, creative disruption. And I think that is the key to understand that this is replacing something. This is not just gradually improving uh, present uh, ways to do business or uh, machine tool and whatever, but it's rather on the disruptive thing. And I think that the world is full of this disruption. And basically, uh, th those who uh, are strong in this are uh, leading the economies in the world. Uh, we, we in Europe, uh, and including Germany, is pro probably uh, not bad in improving step-by-step uh, -step things and gradually improving. But we seem to be, I've lost the idea of a creative destruction. And creative disruption is so two things destruction and disruption and that means basically doing away with business models and what we see now from the largest 20 platforms in the world mm -hmm. there, there's no one in germany surprisingly and, and even not in europe so uh, w w that's what we see and actually the um only the only justification for capitalism is not doing things just better but the only thing for capitalism is economic dynamism. Mm -hmm. And without economic dynamism, we are like the, the old socialist uh, countries who are basically died out. And I think this is something we ought to mm -hmm. understand more and more in Western countries. There is a certain trend to lose the understanding of what capitalism is about. And without that, uh, we will be losing completely. Mr. Jung, you mentioned actually the difference in different countries, and I would like to hijack the conversation a little bit more into that direction. So I think you have been, of course, working internationally. Do you see a strong difference geographically of how important and how adapted and how accepted innovation actually is, even so not only from the broader society, but also in the corporate environments as a potential customers and partners? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very close to the Middle East, and I have to say Middle East has stepped out very much in terms of innovation. Mm -hmm. Look at Dubai, Abu Dhabi, but now even Saudi Arabia, really the, the striving to establish uh, innovation hubs, etc. So I think they have a good card to play. We were commenting before, Peter, that Asia has always been in the forefront on that mm -hmm. as well. So we're looking very much towards Asia. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think what is important, if you operate globally as we do globally, and, and again, it's, what we do is based on trust. We've built the ecosystem to interconnect everyone in the global capital market. And it's very difficult to change the technology from one day to the others. I mean, we have had example in Australia. Mm -hmm. Australia, as a domestic market, have decided in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, to move and change their whole technology from the legacy technology to a DLT technology, mm -hmm. they failed. They failed for one reason. Not everyone is ready at the same time. Mm -hmm. Secondly, innovation shouldn't be a technology play. I think that's a big mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and thirdly, you're isolating yourself as a country because if you really want to interconnect with all the other countries, mm -hmm. nobody is ready at the same time. And that's a challenge that we have as well. So, Mr. Yeah, with your overview. In 18 of the last 20 centuries, Asia always accounted for more than 50% of world GDP. The only exceptions were the last two centuries. So historically, uh, we in Europe were at the end of economic development. And very little happened. The year in, before Christ, and 10,000 uh, 10, before Christ, and 1600, GDP in the world was almost the same. It, nothing has changed. And it was th these ideas of capitalism, it was the ideas of Adam Smith, and it was the Scottish Enlightenment with John Locke and David Hume and Adam Smith, which really made the difference. And I think w we have to understand where this all comes from. It was exported to the United States. The ideas of John Locke, mm -hmm. the American Constitution is based on that. The American, there's nothing American about this. This is all European. But the funny thing is the Europeans mm -hmm. never were able to apply their own ideas. They exported them in the US. And in the US are very successful, are 
are we exporting now in the rest of the world and the Europeans are shocked to see the results of their own ideas which they were never at the time able and to implement themselves. So uh, um, the difference in the world, as you said, I think the answer is already obvious, is those parts of the world who accepted the ideas of the Scottish Enlightenment because the basic idea with David Hume was that you we moved from the age of, exp of, of uh, uh, experience to the age of experimentation. Mm -hmm. And that is the real difference in the world. And uh, on that basis, uh, capitalism is basically nothing else than much better work would be innovation economy mm -hmm. and, uh, and leading to dynamism. And so in your, what I'm hearing you saying is the U.S. is just doing this much better for the last 100 years. Oh, yeah, of course, <laughs> but not only 100, for the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. Well, since the Europeans came, actually a U.S. ambassador, when a friend once said in Germany, he said, actually there are no, no Americans. There are only two groups of Europeans. The one group is we over here, and the other group is the Europeans who missed the boat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is a very, a very nice uh, picture mm -hmm. to understand the, mm -hmm. these uh, kind of differences. Actually, the Chinese were always very, very uh, experiment-oriented. Mm -hmm. They were very entrepreneurial, and technology-wise, Uh, they were far, far ahead mm -hmm. of a lot of development, for instance, in shipping. Mm -hmm. The largest uh, the, uh, largest ship they had uh, in Captain uh, the Admiral Hayes' troop uh, ship was four size uh, of the Santa Maria, uh, of the, the ship yeah. of uh, Columbus. Mm -hmm. And then they decided in the, 40, in the 13th, 15th century, about mm -hmm. 60 years before they, uh, Columbus and they, uh, found America, mm -hmm. Uh, they started, they decided, the government decided, the emperor decided to stop overseas sailing and they allowed only sailing within visibility of the coastline. And that was the, one of the reasons why China went yeah. back Pro into the uh, Protectionism yeah. is not really helpful for economic growth. I think yes, we're all clear on that one, that's for sure. They, they yes. should be careful not making yeah. the same mistake now. Well, we have seen, I think, looking at China, we have seen over the last 30 years how much transformation is possible. I think uh, how much of the ideas have been changed. I remember in 2020 was the first time, uh, I think the highway from the from the train, uh, airport to the hotel, I think the only cars on the highways were Volkswagen Jetta taxis and a couple of Audi A4s for the uh, hotel shuttles. And of course, now if you look around, it has completely transformed. We have some of the largest largest automotive manufacturer, and especially in the electrification, is happening there. So there's definitely a willingness to adopt it. I would just, a quick, um, quick while we're talking about countries, um, one of the things that I think has been really interesting is what the Greek country, ha what happened in the last 20, maybe even 30 years, um, the transformation I think we have seen there. And I know you have been very, very close to it. I'm not sure. Uh, so I would love to hear your perspective of what... Uh, What, what, what have you seen over the last decades? And uh, I think it's, very, it's staggering to see what, where we are today. But how, how has that happened? Last year, the Greek stock market was the best performing stock market in the EU, and in particular in the Eurozone. Interesting enough, uh, many, some people have forgotten the background of that. And uh, unfortunately, last uh, Friday, mm -hmm. I visited, I uh, took part in the funeral of Wolfgang Schäuble, who was hated in uh, Greece at the time. Uh, but without him, probably, Greece would never have found on that back, back on that way. Mm -hmm. And I think they are now on the right track. Uh, but they're not yet there. So there, there's a long way to go. Uh, it, it's very difficult to change uh, an economy from basically a centrally run mm -hmm more or less so, sort of socialist economy into a market economy. Yeah. It's very easy mm -hmm. to move from a market economy into a socialist economy. And uh, mm -hmm. I tell you that the Germans had to learn the lesson after German unity when, when uh, mm -hmm. one third of the country was dominated by a centralist communist country before a government before and to change that into a an, a, um, an economy and a market economy. Mm -hmm. So Greece is on a right track, but it's not yet there. 
It's interesting, last year I was here and I was moderating a panel about education, um, especially how much focus the Greek government and organization talked about education in, uh, in, para, in, in the past. So, and you, I think, uh, mentioned earlier that it's not only about technology transformation, but it's really about transformation of the people. So can you tie those two together for us, please? Okay, I mean, first of all, because we're in the Greek house, so I have to say something about the Greek. Uh, <laughs> You, you remember I mentioned that mm -hmm. what Euroclear do is, is really business resilience. Mm -hmm. So what I see from the Greek people is human resilience, massively. You know, I mean, you've gone through different crises and you always stepped out. So congratulations for that, because I know Greece is really back to the market now. Mm -hmm. And we see the interest on, on the Greek instruments mm -hmm. that we we servicing on behalf of our clients. So it, it, it's really, I mean, I, I like dealing with Greek people because they are very creative, very resilient as human, etc. Now, coming back to your point, I think innovation, you can have the best people thinking about innovation, but you need an ecosystem that actually embrace innovation. Mm -hmm. And to the point of Peter, I think today that ecosystem is in Asia and Middle East to a certain extent as well. So. Of course, the U.S. is big because uh, everything that the U.S. does is so big as well. But Asia, Middle East, and the U.S. would be, for me, the three major markets where you, you, embrace, technology, uh, you embrace innovation. It's not the case in Europe. I'm sorry. I don't see that in Europe. Yes, you get sporadically one country that says, oh, I want to focus a lot on innovation. But you don't have... You don't have the government that is really behind you. Take the example of Singapore. Singapore is just... a it's, it's incredible what they managed to do in such a small country. I mean, everything has get their act together, and they go outside of the market, and they promote and attract interest from outside. Mm -hmm. Today, we're buying, we buying technology from Singapore. We're buying innovation from Singapore. Yeah, I was just at the San Francisco FinTech Festival, and the purposeful, driven innovation management of making not only the institutions, the financial institutions, but really the technology providers behind them, the drivers of the new financial ecosystem for the next decades, I think that is quite impressive, yes. And seeing this holistically. In the memoirs of Lee Van Thieu, you can see a, chap a chapter mm -hmm. on the visit of um, uh, the then uh, mm -hmm. general, um, uh, the, the party secretary general of China mm -hmm. in the um, in 1978, um, 77, 78, yeah. and at the end of the visit of five days, he said uh, to uh, Li Fan to "This is very strange. You are Chinese people. We are Chinese people. You are rich. We are poor. It's the same Chinese people. So it's not the people who have the difference. It's the politics, and that was the key." of changing mm -hmm. uh, dramatically and the decision for uh, China going markets. So it's not only about what we are doing and what technology or which technology we are implementing, it's really about how and how do we bring the people with us on this journey. It, it is so important not that not centrally someone decides about which technology is applied. It's, it's a constant search mm -hmm. and we have to understand there is never an end. The, 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 the volume of our knowledge is limited, Karl Popper said, but the, the volume of our unknowledge is unlimited. And we are in that uncharted waters, and there is no end to that. And the idea that the government makes a decision one day and says, we're going to implement that technology, or the shrewd idea of having a European uh, a European AI company mm -hmm. to fight off the Americans. If if you want to uh, if if you want to uh, contribute to the death in, of technology in Europe, you just have to follow that idea. So the the Europeans have a tendency to regulate things of which you have no understanding what this is going to be. <laughs> they don't know what they're regulating, but very proud of having a regulation now. The Americans do not have a regulation. They look at it, they watch it, it and it's, it's piecemeal engineering, rather, uh, as Papa would have said. It's piecemeal engineering. You learn with the next step, you look at it, you see what's going on, and then you 
put under regulation, <laughs> but not before you know what you are regulating. And I think we have to watch that very carefully and only can encourage everybody here in this room and outside, spread the message. As soon as we try to regulate things before they are there, we <laughs> will not be successful. That's the <laughs> definitely answer to that. Yeah. 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 I take your point of not knowing actually to go back to one of the technologies we're applying to discussing, cybersecurity. So many, many years ago I was at Microsoft and we had uh, source code reviews with governments and I'll never forget the team of MR5s throwing up. Um, looking at the source code and figuring out which direction we are going. And the head of MI5 usually said there's, reminded me, there's only two kinds of organizations. Now it makes sense. There's the organizations that have been hacked and the organizations that do not know they have been hacked. So I, was so I think all of us are working every day in the technology field. Um, we are victims or at least uh, targets of attacks. I was just trying to see what, what did you, from your perspective, I think, uh, Mr. Ferrand, what have you seen over the last years and have the threat level changed and the actors changed? I think, yes, it has changed the threat level. Um, and when I speak to my um, cyber security guys, I mean, they're telling me it's not a question of when it will happen, it's a question of how it will happen. Mm -hmm. And remember, I mean, we operate internationally. So I think if you operate domestically only, you, you can find your way in ring fencing that access. But internationally, we have big clients, and I'm going to name a few of them, like uh, JP Morgan, Citibank, etc. And I don't think the threat will come via those big clients. At the same time, we have smaller clients located in less sophisticated jurisdiction. And, and that's where the risk for us would probably come from. Mm -hmm. So that would be the entry door for a potentially hacking or attack. Mm -hmm. Because we believe that everyone has invested massively. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you name like JP Morgan, of course, it's on, the, on your agenda. If you're a small bank in Bangladesh, sorry to say it, but yes, they're less sophisticated, and maybe that, that's the entry door to, to our system. Yeah. So again, we, we spent a lot of money in ring fencing, but it's not a question about money. It's a question about being ready when it happens. So it's got back to the topic of resilience. I, mean, I think uh, you, see, you see a lot of uh, startups when they're very excited about their ideas. But again, how, is it, how do they protect their competitive advantage? What would you recommend them today in this world? I said both of you, I think you may, so how important is protection? How important is uh, cybersecurity, no, no, or even for startups? Uh, okay, protection is much less important than running faster. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the key, running faster. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you can you can have a different make a mm -hmm. difference then yeah. rather mm -hmm. uh, than being protected. I, I think it it is very early to try to protect yourself and to spend too much capacity on that. Okay. So one of the things we've talked about is innovation in general, countrywide especially. But I think for entrepreneurs, the topics of funding has been a huge, huge challenge, especially over the last few years, from the craziness of, uh, of the boom years to the crashes that we haven't seen over the last two years. Um, and I just saw the latest pitch book numbers that even investments in AI, that's the super hot topic, of course, where everybody tries to place their positions now. In the last quarter, even those investments have gone down. Um, Looking at the investor scene, especially in the early stage startups, seed, pre-seed, Series A, um, what, is the, what are you seeing? What is the recommendations for, for entrepreneurs? Well, we have to see that we had a tremendous jump in uh, VC uh, funding in, uh, in the, uh, since the 15th, uh, 19th, uh, 2016. Uh, why? Uh, you, you, there's a very easy relationship between z zero interest rates and, uh, and uh, venture funding. Uh, now you have the reverse. Uh, you, have, uh, you, had a you have a 5% uh, or 4% uh, interest rate and you have less. And, on, on, and maybe even at least the same important is uh, from a, a rather benign economic uh, uh, environment, we've gone into a very difficult, complicated political environments, several. It's a multiple crisis, uh, as, uh, in, a, in a book which has been uh, published by Harold. And uh, um, so what we've seen, uh, we had an incredible jump. China went from, for instance, in 2010 to 2021, uh, from uh, 3 billion 
venture capital investment to 100. And now they're down to 50. You see um, the jump in the U.S. similar, uh, and even the U.S. is coming down by 40%. Globally, we're down by even a bit more than 40%. So uh, we have, we've seen now in 22, uh, we have seen the downturn. We have seen a continuous downturn in 23. What more worrying is, is the fact that we had 80% drop in IPOs. And that means the exit is so becoming more difficult. And the, the more difficult the exit becomes, the more difficult is find the new investment. Brian Cohen, the ch longtime chairman of the New York Angels, always said mm -hmm. to me, Peter, you've got to understand, we are in the exit business. We are not in the business of building a company. We are in the building of exiting a company. <laughs> and that is why we are investing. Yes. And I think that is so important yes. to understand this mm -hmm. because that explains the food chain in yeah. uh, venture funding and the food chain of financing <laughs> of innovation is, is angels, is seed, uh, pre-seed, seed, VC, and yeah. then A rounds, B rounds, C rounds, and so on. And then we even have private equity. And before that, we have an IPO and so on. <laughs> so that food chain, mm -hmm. that doesn't work in Europe. No. That works perfectly in the US. Mm -hmm. And it works very good in other parts of the world mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Uh, but if we have a downturn in the globally in the world in that, and now everybody is saying, mm -hmm. but the prospects for 24 is uh, better. Well, th this is, uh, uh, you know, th this is like the guy who is falling out of the window in the 20th story, and on the 12th story, someone is calling out and says, how are you doing? And he says, oh, <laughs> fine, until now. So, so far, yes, so far, so good. <laughs> and that's exactly yes. where we yeah. are at the moment. No, but it's interesting, like, even the US companies, startups, I mean, I, I see a lot of pitches. We do a lot of mentoring for the Alliance of Angels. Um, very, very often they are so excited about the ideas and said, you know what, the first thing you need to tell me as an investor, when and how much of my money do I get back? And you get me excited about the prospects. Doesn't really matter what you do. The numbers need to work out first. That's for sure. Um, so, we, sorry, do you want to add? Yeah. yeah, maybe because mm -hmm. what, what I've seen, mm -hmm. I mean, not only with us, but uh, mm -hmm. globally with banks mm -hmm. or other financial market infrastructure is the change and the speed of new technology, new, I mean, new things like AI, etc. You just can't do that internally anymore. Mm -hmm. be before all those banks and financial market infrastructure, they only had one mandate, I need to build that internally. Mm -hmm. And now everyone is opening up and say, we need to partner, we need to mutualize the effort, mm -hmm. we need to acquire companies, or at least to take an equity stake in those companies. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think it comes to the point that those companies also realize it's more difficult to get funding on the street as well. Mm -hmm. So that's why they, they're looking also at institu well-established institutions. How can I help them? Mm -hmm. And I mean, before, yeah. how can they help us, you yes. see, mm -hmm. in transforming our technology, but not only the technology, transforming the way we do business, the type of business we do, etc. So there are new things like in the ESG space, in the digital space. Mm -hmm. We don't have that knowledge. So it's better to acquire that knowledge one mm -hmm. way or the others. Yeah. And we give them the possibility to scale mm -hmm. their product okay. as well. So you know, There's so much innovation happening. So with, with having analyzed the history and the current situation quite deeply, I want to make sure we are wrapping this up a little bit more with a look to the future. So the recommendation to the communities of what will the future hold, what are the key trends we should be making ourselves available for um, technology-wise. But again, as we just said, it's not only the what, it's the how. Um, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, I think for us, the big transformation and tipping point will be when the central bank will, will force into a central bank digital currency. So you would need everyone, banks, uh, financial market infrastructure to transform themselves into a more digital technology, which we don't have today. Mm -hmm. But again, to the point of Peter, often and unfortunately often is being pushed by regulation. Mm -hmm. In that instance, I think it will be pushed by the central bank themselves that will embrace the possibility to issue digitally, okay, to have better controls, I mean, uh, speed to market, etc. But at the same time, that will force everyone. Sorry, you mentioned GTB. Can you just elaborate I think for, the, for the people in the audience? What is GTB? No. Yes. Central Bank Digital oh. Currency, CBDC. CBDC. Yes. Okay, CBDC. thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So no. it's nothing else than the euro you have in your pocket will become digital. No more euro in the pocket, only on the iPhone. So. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so th that that is coming. So I see that as a as, as a major transformational shift for mm -hmm. us. Okay. What the banking you? industry. Yeah, the banking and for the banking industry in general. Peter, what do you see as the key trends that are going to dominate the next decade? I don't know what what's going to dominate mm -hmm. uh, the next thing. If I would know that, I wouldn't waste my time on a <laughs> panel like this. <laughs> um, but um, there are a few uh, there are a few indications. Mm -hmm. uh, if um, I know everybody's talking about AI, so I I cannot afford to not talk about AI, of course. Uh, but what is it? I was u recently on in, in Beijing, uh, no, in Guangzhou actually, at the uh, Understanding China conference on a panel was about AI and humanity. And, it, and it's interesting to see that such a panel is in China, uh, that they worry about humanity in that uh, relationship. But the, the, the thing is, uh, do we have an understanding of what AI is? What is it? You can ask, uh, you can make an inquiry. I'm, I'm too polite to now to make it here. We probably would get uh, 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 10 or 20 more definitions than people are in the room. Uh, because uh, for the simple reason, there is so as a wide area of understanding. And do we really know what it is and, and, and what this is about and what this is about to do? Some people say, oh, this is replacing human, the way of how people think. Uh, and there's, I think there's a lot of nonsense in that. But may, maybe it's about the way to understand, to understand how people think. It's not about doing the thinking, but how they think, which could lead to incredible developments in terms of mass data and analysis of mass data and all this. So I'm not going into that, but I'm certainly, this is an, an area, but this is not a technology. Yeah, this is an approach of using existing technologies in order to get better insights into a world which we today, for today, we need incredible efforts in terms of training of people, of education. I don't know what's going to do to doctors. It's going to be, uh, in, certainly for health, could be incredible developments possibly, but which replace a lot of things. We may find a situation in the world where a smaller group of people uh, will have seen improving their living conditions tremendously and see that for a majority of people or large, large amounts of people, uh, this is not going to be the case. Their jobs may fall away. I can't give you an answer, but I have more questions than answers, and I hope that we will find, continue to put uh, more questions to that mm. before we come up with simple uh, answers. But the interesting thing is, in 1617, we saw a tremendous increase of venture capital investment in China in AI. A lot of this was with our U.S. Mm -hmm. our venture capital firms investing in China in AI. Mm -hmm. Recently, in 2022, we see a reversal of that. The U there's more investing in the U.S. than now in China. It was the contrary to what we saw before. And the second thing is, it looks like that the U.S. is leading uh, back the pack. The, so then now we're number one again. And I'm not sure whether they will give that position up. Europe is not in the forefront uh, of that. And when we talk about a lot of other things about Europe and the U.S. and their difference, we should be very careful on whether we're not producing another area where we now intentionally try, as we said before, try to regulate things of which we have no understanding yet what it really is about. And it could be that the Europeans make a decision to we walk out of that, although they do not intend to do that, but they make everything at the moment, everything possible for that to happen. So like with every conversation, it feels like on stage and off stage, we ended up at the topic of AI. So I have to ask out of personal curiosity, um, it's not only about, of course, the chatbots and the banking industry sets up in the background. Uh, it's about threat activation, or a threat defense threats that are coming in. Just maybe oh, sorry, a few minutes, just out of my own curiosity, how are you thinking about the, the world of the future 
driven by AI, especially in your area of banking and banking infrastructure? So, I mean, I mean first of all, I, I mentioned that everything that the banks do or we, what we do is driven by looking for more efficiency. And I think AI is a typical tool that can help you to bring mm -hmm. more efficiency. Can efficiency in the process, efficiency in the detection. Mm -hmm. Talking here about AML KYC, for example, um, screening of transactions. Uh, you can find a lot of patterns that a human being wouldn't be able to find on its own. Um, so, because if you put all the historical data into it, mm -hmm. AI will help you just to better understand the flows, better understand who's doing mm -hmm. what and what are the bank are doing with us uh, okay. when they're using our account, as an example. Mm -hmm. So AI is really about, again, efficiency and prevention. And, and in our business, that's what really matters. Uh, it so could be about, if I may add one, one thing, it could be about a lot of areas where we talk about, Kai Fuli has made these differences in three or four uh, ways of uh, AI. Uh, one is the internet, but the, the other is on uh, recognition uh, and um, defining and finding out uh, out of mass information uh, uh, structures. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would be, uh, uh, for instance, in autonomous uh, driving uh, could lead to uh, tremendous developments of which we do not know at the moment how to use, uh, how to solve certain problems. I need, to, I, sir, I need to make sure that the one thing that I really want to know is getting through before we run out of time and get pulled off stage. With having so many decades of experience here on the stage, and having people from all walks of life, but especially budding entrepreneurs and young people from the next generation are watching us over today and, of course, then uh, over the next months online as well. What is your recommendation for the next generation of leaders of what they should focus on to drive success for them, for their organizations, but also for society in general? Okay, so, I mean, I mentioned that we've gone through uh, over the years, and honestly, we never done, we never done that in the past, massive wave of partnership and acquisitions, yeah. And what is very difficult to make happen is the difference of culture. You know, often the buyers like us, because yes, we have decades of experience, we have money so we can easily buy. We're still in the mindset, which is wrong. It's my way or no way, okay? So how can you actually incorporate the, the new culture that those partner brings to us and, and really leverage that. So I think a CEO or, um, I mean, senior management should really look at, okay, we've been doing that business for so many years, but they're coming with different view of how to do the business. And we should embrace that, mm -hmm. honestly, because otherwise we've seen examples of well-established companies that have disappeared from one day mm -hmm. to the others. I'm not saying it will happen to us, yeah. but mm -hmm. the risk is out there. There's a disruption in technology, there's uh, AI yeah. coming, so things will be done differently. And today, all seniors don't master that. Mm -hmm. So we need to, to learn from those youngsters, to learn mm -hmm. from those uh, fintech, rec tech companies that have actually had brilliant idea, but what they're missing also is the funding, one yeah. thing, but also the scale. And, and we can bring that access to that ecosystem. Excellent. Mr. Jung, and I would like to, based on your decades of experience and so many waves of technology transformation, what are your guiding words to the next generations and the leaders of tomorrow? Started. <laughs> <laughs> no, the most important thing is getting started. I think that uh, you, you, there's no master plan. Uh, th th this, if you waste your time on a master plan, and uh, so about it, this is the most important thing, and and believe in yourself, believe in yourself, and trust, and tr try to get friends whom, uh, with Adam Smith, you you feel empathy. Uh, I think that that is the key. The rest is is not important. You you will be successful if you follow that path. You will be not successful if you look on patterns of others uh, because uh, there are probably more patterns of people who failed than people who were successful. Uh, on the other hand, you have to understand 75, so about 70%, 75% of all startups don't make it for the first five years. Mm -hmm. So then they're not going to prep, they're just surviving prep school age mm -hmm. and then that's it. <laughs> If, if yeah. you cannot stand a risk, mm -hmm. forget it. If you, the most important 
culture probably mm-hmm. is not a winner culture, is the failure culture. Mm-hmm. It's to fail, to fall down, stand up and continue to walk. I think that is the mm-hmm. key for everybody who wants to not take a risk of starting a business, mm-hmm. but want to live a successful so life. Back to the po- Thank you so much. Going back to the points uh, we made, it's all about resilience, learning, adopting and embracing of the change that is, co- that is coming with it. It's, of course, change very close to my head. I thank you very much, Mr. Ferrand, Mr. Jungen. Uh, I thank the Greek House for bringing us all together. It was another brilliant conversation where I learned a lot and I really appreciate you making all of this possible. The audience, um, thank you very much. I wish whatever your goals are over the next weeks and in your life, I wish you a successful Davos and a great journey. Thank you very much. <laughs>